You know, Christmas, so we've been talking about pre preparation to receive Christ. Uh, Advent is the season in which uh, we uh, turn our focus to uh, seeing how God can prepare us uh, so, that, so that we're able to recognize uh, the Christ when he enters into our world in kind of a radical, uh, upsetting way. And um, I realized that uh, sometimes uh, that's a difficult thing to do because our expectations, uh, has anybody ever had their expectations disappointed? Or am I like the only one? <laughs> Anything ever happen? you're feeling disappointed? Uh, I'm a little bit afraid sometimes to get my hopes up, you know, because uh, things, things don't always turn out. And I remember one of my, the most poignant uh, times uh, at Christmas time that I can remember was years ago when I was a pastor at University Press, and uh, uh, our, my boss, Bruce Larson, drew the short straw and was going to do the children's sermon, you know, at Christmas. And... Uh, and so um, he got all the kids up in the front, sitting on the steps, and he's being really, you know, grandfatherly. And hey, tell me about the presents you got. And somebody got a doll, and somebody got a Star Wars character thing, and someone this is really old. They got a Snake Mountain thing with a microphone. And uh, and uh, and one of the boys is sitting there really quietly, and he goes, hey, "What did you get?" My parents got a divorce for Christmas. <laughs> the response was just like that, only with like a thousand people. The whole place went. <gasps> <laughs> and the air went out of the room, and the little boy just sat there, you know, just didn't say anything else. My parents got a divorce for Christmas. And I started praying for Bruce. Oh, Lord, <laughs> whatever story he had, you know. And he, and he just looked at the kid and he said, you know, isn't that, isn't that the way it is? Sometimes you open a present and you don't like it. <laughs> the present you got is not what you wanted. And uh, you didn't get one you liked this year. Isn't, isn't that the way it is? And I thought about that a lot because so often, you know, we, we think, oh, everything's going to be wonderful, everything's going to be great, this is going to be the best ever, and then something happens and, uh, and our hearts are broken um, in different ways. It happens for us as kids, it happens for us as adults. I was uh, thinking this morning about, um, well, I asked myself, why, John, I have to ask myself questions sometimes by name, John, why are you such a cynic? Which is a good question, right? Why are you so cynical about everything? You know, you never just go along with the flow of the joy, you know? You always have some suspicion. And I realized today what it was. When did I become a cynic? It was when I was uh, very young, and I'd read the comic books, and in the back of the comic books, they'd have ads. And there was one that just captivated me because it was for a, a cabin, uh, like a log cabin that you could have as a playhouse. And uh, it was five dollars, which you know back then. I mean, that was <laughs> that was five dollars. And so uh, I went to my dad, asked if I could do work. So he, he gave me a bunch of eggplants to sell door to door. <laughs> <laughs> you know that in itself has its own sadness. <laughs> Want to buy some of these Christmas eggplants, man? <laughs> So anyway, I did that, and uh, I went to, I kept a time log, you know, while he was working, and I'd, I'd stay out of his way for 50 cents an hour, and I did that. <laughs> and uh, I, I finally got my five bucks, filled out the thing, and sent it in, and then it says, you know, we'll be delivered in about 90 days. And 90 days, I counted down, it was so, wait, I couldn't believe that for five dollars I could get a log cabin playhouse. And how are they going to mail it to me? And, you know, this is so, so amazed by the whole thing. This is going to be the greatest thing in my life. And, and 90 days came and went and nothing. And then one day I got this envelope and I opened it up. And in it was a plastic bag about the thickness of, you know, the veggie bags at the QFC, you know, the little thin ones. And it had, it had been printed like a log cabin playhouse on the outside of this bag. And the instructions were, get a card table, put it over it. <laughs> Tear a hole where the door picture is. <laughs> get, are you getting the sadness here? <laughs> All of my dreams and hopes and everything were just Smashed. I never even got the card table and set it up. It was so humiliating. 
And, uh, and, and I thought that was the moment that I became a cynic. <laughs> that right there, that was the moment when I'm not trusting anyone, I'm not trusting anything, I'm going to be suspicious, I'm going to look for other motives, and, and I've been faithful to that vow, <laughs> haven't I? I've, I've led you guys, and I've, I've never been the positive one. You know, you've always had to come to me and help me see hope in the middle of it. So today, as we're in, as we're in anticipation and preparation to, to receive Christ, as God breaks into our world in a radical way, my... Skepticism goes way up. What if it's not what I think it'll be? What if Jesus comes into my life and it's different than I'd hoped it would be? And, and so um, our scripture today is from Matthew 3, and it's about uh, Jesus' cousin, uh, John the Baptist, they call him. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching uh, in the desert of Judea and said, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. And this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Yeah, he was living large. And uh, people went out to see him from Jerusalem and Judea and the whole region of Jordan. And confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And when he saw many of the religious people coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We of Abraham is our father. I tell you, these stones God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. I am baptized with water for repentance, but after me will come someone who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering the wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And then Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Okay, John is spoken of throughout the Gospels, uh, Jesus' cousin, and uh, probably grew up together, and John was the fiery prophet, and said, when God comes, let me tell you what's going to happen. And he's very clear about it. And, uh, and Jesus went to him to be baptized, and at the beginning of his ministry, and, um, and you think, you know, they really had an understanding. The one who would proclaim it in advance, and then Jesus would come and fulfill the prophecy. That must have been a great thing. But then, uh, as many of you know, if you go a little further in Matthew, uh, uh, chapter 11, it says, When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? What went wrong? Should we look for somebody else? Jesus said, go back and report to John what you hear and see. <clears throat> well, how could someone as faithful and believing and outspokenly positive as John, the baptizer, the cousin of Jesus, the proclaimer, the one who went before and paved the way, who baptized Jesus, how could he then, not long after, turn around and go, hey, what's up, Jesus? Are you the one, or should we look for somebody else? Because you're not doing it right. Think about that. When Christ comes into your world and into your life, when he breaks in radically this Christmas, are you going to go, hey, what's up with that? This is not what I was looking for. Um, I was told early on, you know, if you give your life to Christ, if you accept him as your Savior, you know, your whole life's going to come together. Everything will be great. You'll, you, the girls will like you. Your room will be clean. You'll do, get good grades. You'll maybe get a scholarship to somewhere like the junior college or something and, and uh, aspire. And, uh, you know, so I did many, many times, over and over again. I'd go forward at the Baptist church and I'd accept Christ into my life. And you know what? My life never got together, ever. Not even for short periods of time. And I went, well, Jesus, are you the one? Or should we look for somebody else? 
I think that is one of the most profound questions that we can ask as we prepare for Christ to break into our world. Are you the one, or should we look for somebody else? No. John had expectations. He put his whole career, he put his whole ministry on the line with his message. I love that. The, the axe is at the root, and it will cut down through, and you'll be, you unfruitful people are going to be taken up and thrown on the fire, and you'll be consumed in flame. Well, there's a message, you know. I <laughs> preach on that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the way you get fired up for that. You know, it, it's all destruction. And when Jesus comes, the Messiah, he's going to come, and he'll have his winnowing fork, and he's going to separate you, and all you bad stuff's going to get burned up. You're going to get consumed. That's his message. You better turn around, you better change, you better get productive because Jesus is coming. That's where we got, you better watch out, you better not. <laughs> I think it was a quick change over there to the carolers. Uh, that made me terrified of Santa, I'll tell you that. But, but that was John the Baptist's message. And he expected this, and then Jesus comes all about God's love his care and his healing and his reaching out to the to the weak and the wobbly and the people who thought they had everything going it'll turn for them and the people who were really struggling well that turns for them and uh, coming alongside and we gotta love our neighbor and we gotta do good to those who, who use us and abuse us and, and, and all of it and John's in prison going what's going on this isn't right Jesus better get on message. <laughs> Jesus said, go back. Tell John what you see and hear. Tell him. Tell him what you see and hear. Now, <clears throat> I think that for us, this Christmas, it's really important to admit that from time to time, we've all been disappointed with God, haven't we? We've had prayers and ideas and hopes and all these things, and we've been disappointed. Some have been disappointed in big ways, huge letdowns. How could this have, God, how did you let this happen? How could, where were you? Why didn't you do so? Why didn't you intervene? And, and in the, kind of the darkness of not seeing how God's working, there's some really good reasons for disappointment. On the other hand, some of us haven't had the really big reasons, but we've had a lot of little disappointments along the way. None of them very significant, really. Right? Little things, don't even want to bring them up. Unanswered prayers, prayers answered the wrong way, misunderstandings, God just not showing up the way we thought he would. And, and those little disappointments accumulate in our hearts and in our minds. And they accumulate, and pretty soon they become this giant boulder, like a spiritual boulder that we just can't get out of the way. And we go, I'll, I'll do Christmas, but I just don't understand what's going to happen when Jesus breaks into my world because he didn't come the way I needed him to before. Have you ever felt like that? I think that when we have, whether it's large disappointments or small disappointments, when they've accumulated over time, it, it stops our ability to experience faith. It stops our ability to experience hope and to, and to get a hold of God's incredible love and coming into the world so that we can live. And if we don't admit it, we never get over it. We never get past that boulder. We never get it out of the way and allow God to break into our world in a new way. Um, Andy Dillard has a real interesting quote. Um, she's a kind of a novelist, 
old hippie novelist, really. You know, he lives out in the country, grows flowers and vegetables and stuff, but writes novels. She says this, you do not have to sit in the dark. If, however, you want to look at the stars, you'll find that the darkness is required. The stars neither require it or demand it. You don't have to sit in the dark. You know, God sometimes seems like he's in the dark for us, and we don't see him, and we don't see his uh, presence in our world. We don't see him uh, involved in our life in, in ways, and, and we don't want to sit in the dark, and we don't want to sit there with a God that we can't see, but she makes a good point. If you want to see the stars, you've got to be in the dark. It's really hard to see the stars when you're standing at the foot of the space needle. Have you ever tried that in Seattle? You're, you're at the base of the, base of the, look at this. I'm at, you're looking up and you know what you see? The restaurant. People getting sick eating while they're turning. And uh, you don't see any stars. get out on uh, the pass at night, well, four in the afternoon <laughs> in Seattle, that's midnight anywhere else, right? <laughs> you get out on the pass, you look up there, you see the stars, right? I think that there's something in this. If we could recognize the points of our disappointment, the, the dark places, the, the shadowy places of our lives where we feel like we've got to stay cynical. You know, be prepared for discipline. You know, those places. And, we, and in, that, in the very places of our disappointment, if we allow our eyes to adjust in that, I think that that's where God reveals himself to us. Not in the bright, shiny, you know, space needle events of our life. It's, it's, it's when we're alone and things seem too dark and, and, it, and then we start to see his presence that's been there all along, but we haven't really seen it because we've got so many other lights going on, blocking us out. Um, I don't know, something for me to think about this Christmas because I don't want to miss what God wants to do. And uh, I've got a book for it. This, this is an old book, but it's... Still meaningful to me. Um, Disappointment with God by Philip Yancey. A uh, very old book. I still have the cover. Yeah. Uh, this is what he says. If we insist on visible proofs from God, we may well prepare the way for a permanent state of disappointment. True faith does not so much attempt to manipulate God to do our will as it does to position us to do his will. As I searched through the Bible for models of great faith, I was struck with how few saints experienced anything like Job's dramatic encounter with God. The rest responded to God's hiddenness, not by demanding that he show himself, but by going ahead and believing him, though he stayed hidden. Right? Hebrews 11, he says, notes that the giants of the faith did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Think about that. Well, maybe that's what faith is, that we, that we welcome God's promises from a distance and, and we don't always experience them the way we want. We human beings instinctively regard the seen world as the real world and the unseen world as the unreal world. But the Bible calls for almost the opposite. Through faith, the unseen world increasingly takes shape as the real world and sets the course for how we live. Live for God, who's invisible, and not for other people, said Jesus in his words about the unseen world, the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on. Once the apostle Paul directly addressed the question of disappointment with God, he told the Corinthians, in spite of incredible hardships, he did not, quote, lose heart. He did not lose heart. Though outwardly, he says, we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what's seen, but on what's unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen, that's eternal. So how do we prepare for God to enter our world? How, how do we get ourselves ready 
spiritually, emotionally, relationally, mentally? How do we get ourselves ready so that we don't miss what God wants to do in us? We don't miss what he wants to do through us. I think that it begins with some radical honesty. Radical honesty. That, that says, Lord, I got a big <coughs> disappointment in you that, that I've, been, I've been holding on to instead of faith. Or I've got a lot of little ones, and they're just irritants, you know. There's nothing big enough to mention, nothing to share during the prayer time with Susie, you know. Nothing that big, you know, just little irritants. But they've sure added up to something, and I just don't want to trust you. I think that's the prayer we need to do this week. I don't want to be set up and, and fooled again. Lord... Help me to see you even in the shadowy times that I'm sitting in. Help me to see you there. I think if that's our prayer this week, guess what? I think he'll go, thank you. Thanks for being honest. Let me show you who I am, who you are, who we are together. Let me break into your world. So well, you know me, I got a homework assignment for you. <laughs> sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I want you to take a piece of paper this week. I want you to write a letter to God. Don't just pray it. I want you to write it down. Dear God, it's Tuesday, day before trash day. Uh, here's something. John gave us this stupid assignment, but I gotta do it. And and then start writing down. Okay, Lord, I got a big disappointment that keeps me from having faith. I got a big, here's, here's where I, I didn't see you when I needed you. And this is how it felt. Uh, I need you to break into my world. Or I, you know, it's only been little things, Lord. You know, I'm not, not enough to mention, but since John's given us this assignment, I gotta list them. These little irritations along the way. Lord, you just weren't there and what happened? And I don't understand that. And I got some questions. And write them down. Write them down. Say, Lord, I'm, I'm just bringing it to you so they can get out of the way so I can have faith and live in spite of these things. And I can see you when you break into my world. That's what Advent is to me. Excavation. We dig up the stuff and we get it set aside so that God can do something new. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love and care, even in the shadowy times when we may not see it and recognize it. Thank you that we can be totally honest with you and we don't have to pretend everything's okay. And... Uh, and thank you that we don't have to approach your coming into our world with fear. That we can welcome you with hope and with joy. That's our need. This Christmas, that's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen.